another edition of Air Power Live. I have my friend and colleague, Eddie Rose. How you doing, Eddie? Doing super. Good. All right, ready for some education? Here we go, Air Power Live. So you want a power token. You want to get a power token. First, there's a few things you got to think about before you start. A lot of things, actually. Let's talk about the most important piece of the puzzle. Park Sam. No. No. Yeah. Why not? Park Sam, in general, the part that you want to talk about. Has to be agreeable to the temperature of your cure. What does that mean? That means powders have a coating cured at a certain temperature. It cross links and it cures. It, it, it gels, it cross links, it cures at a certain temperature. The lowest everyday powder that you're going to find for exterior use is low end around 350. Typically all day long, 350 degrees. Uh, and you're going to be curing that 15 minutes. Uh, 392 degrees is going to be 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes Fahrenheit. So when we talk about that, whatever your powder coating has to be able to withstand a, basically a 400 or a 420 degree oven for not 10 or 12 minutes at 300 at that temperature. But the part's got to come up in temperature and then maintain for another 10 to 12 minutes. So we're talking 30 Fig minutes, figure 30 minutes, 45 minutes if it's really heavy, a wheel or steel. Right. So part code capability, uh, compatibility is a huge issue. So if you're a job shop, then you have to do some research on the parts that your customers are bringing to you, so that you ensure that they're not going to melt when you put them in the oven. Let's talk about another piece of that: the quality of the part that they're getting. Okay, Got so it's metal and it can withstand 392 degrees, but what if the weld is really bad? It's going to show up. What if they've got Bondo on it? It's going to melt out. That's right. I've heard the horror stories of people that have like a, a car part <laughs> that they put in the oven and halfway through the cure cycle they hear ding, ding, ding. And it's pieces of the part that are actually falling off because the bonding agent that they use to put this together when it glues or adhesive, which are metal, um, let go. Yeah, all metal works real well. Yeah. Doesn't drip out. So there are options, but you really need to think about part quality. Are they bringing to you really nasty oil sludge, uh, weld splatter, all these kinds of things all over the part? Think about it. You you now have the you are charged with power coating this part from its ugly nasty status. Yep. And delivering a perfect part. So basically, what we're saying. Just remember, no matter how they deliver that part to you, if you accept that part, they're expecting you to do whatever it needs to be done to that part. You own all of it. Yeah, if it's covered in smut, grease, dirt, oil, whatever it is, if it's covered in whale fat. <laughs> uh, if it's covered in all that stuff, you've got to deal with it. You can't just throw it on a hook and power coat it in your easy thing does it and expect it to be good. Nope. It's, it's, a, it's a process. So that brings me to what we really need to talk about. The first stage in the process. You got to clean it. You have to clean your part and typically we call that pre-treatment. Uh, there's chemical suppliers out there that you can deal with. There's blasting media that you can blast the part to clean it and pre-treat it in and prep it and get it ready. There's a multitude of ways to clean it. Some parts may come to you almost pristine and all you have to do is take an alcohol wipe to them and you're ready to go. You might want to take a tack cloth, wipe it down so that you remove any contamination there and you make a good flaw free finish. On the other side, there are parts that require more The owner brings a few and says, here, I want this done. I'm going to sell this part, whatever it is or maybe a component of something else. I'm going to sell this to my customers, and I have to give them a two-year warranty or a five-year warranty on color and gloss and everything else. Let me just tell you, you need to work with your power supplier at that point and your pre-treatment supplier, both, in concert, to make sure that the pre-treatment will give you the adhesion that you need on the And that the powder that you're using 
being degraded for color and gloss longevity to get what you need. You cannot emphasize those enough. And exposure. It's absolutely. So that's almost another segment in itself. You, you have to look at when your customer brings you a product into your shop, you need a checkoff list. Find out what their needs are. Sign off on the color that you're going to paint it. Make them sign off on it that you've showed them an REL color or what have you in your cart in your chart, your color chart. And that way they don't come back to you and say, oh, no, that's not the color I wanted. Yes, it is. It's right here. You, you signed off on it. So that sign-off sheet is something that we will probably get into later in another video. But for now, that gets you started on the thinking process of when a product comes into your shop, what are we going to do? You have to get it ready. And sometimes glass is okay by itself. Sometimes glass is not okay. So cleaning pre-treatment is a major factor. Once you get it pre-treated, once you get it clean, you're ready to powder coat, then your powder is going to give you a cure schedule. So now you know what temperature and for how long you have to cure the part, or some folks call it baking. But how long is it going to be in the oven? So that's the second thing that you need to know in this piece of the puzzle. Right. And speak very clearly and plainly with your powder supplier. They will educate you on how to cure your part. Yeah, I mentioned this a little earlier. If the part says, uh, or if the powder box says uh, 10 to 12 minutes at 392 degrees, that doesn't mean you open the oven door, roll your part in, shut the oven door, and then turn your oven on and let it go for 12 to 15 minutes. You have to preheat that oven up to 392 degrees or just above, not too much above. And then you have to basically start the cycle. Once that part reaches 10 to 12, 10 to 12 minutes at right. that temperature. So, long story short, be very open with your powder coat supplier. And wherever you buy your powders, some of you buy them online, some of you buy a baby food jar, some of you buy direct from, your, from a manufacturer of powder. Uh, there's a lot of them. Um, make sure you're getting that support and that knowledge. Don't just buy powder to buy powder. I've seen the nightmare where people get sued because they use a certain kind of powder. And I've been involved in that process where I had to go and verify the powder was misused. An interior powder was used on an exterior job and failed miserably. So you want to also build that partnership by a line. Let's talk about maybe the different components of the actual line. So we'll be done. So if we're going to spray powder, we have to spray it in something like this. You have to spray it in a booth. You have to contain the overspray, right? So you're going to contain that and just be cognizant of if you're building a shop, you got to have a booth, right? Whether it's you're going to recover powder if you're only doing one color or you're going to spray it all to waste and then it's going to be gone, right? So while we're on waste, let's talk about that. You have to dispose of any powder that's not going to be used. Check with your local landfill or your trash provider and decide how best that they can accept your powder waste. It's inert. There's no VOCs. There's not anything in there that's going to hurt the environment. But if you go out and you put a bag into the local landfill and the bulldozer runs over it, you go, <laughs> there's a problem. So you have to talk to them about that, about how you're going to dispose of it. Some people put it in the oven, bake it out. It's a solid. Throw it right to the dump. You don't have to ask any questions. Uh, I want to step back. He opened up with food. I want to add what I think is extremely important. That would be the doors. A boot is meant to be the, something that captures that waste. Yes. So you're enclosing an area. Your filters will, like behind us, are cartridge filters. A huge bank of cartridge filters. This is a big vacuum. Post. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a ginormous vacuum. Uh, if you had doors on the front, and let's say this was an enclosed booth and not a conveyorized booth like this is, this would be tough because you've got an opening here, vestibule there, vestibule there, and an opening here. However, if these were closed, a standard booth, no matter if it's small or large, and you had doors on the front, the doors could have filters in them that cleans the air on the way into the booth. Therefore, flies, dust, other bugs, uh, trash floating around the shop uh, doesn't become airborne and in the process 
of tripping your favorite airplane moving through your booth, you just about to go to park and, you know, all the dust goes on the park. You have the door with filters in them, there's poly or whatever that have a pack on the back of them that catches all that fine dirt and trash. You're able to avoid those costly reports. It, 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 it's a 100% must if you're doing class A finishes. So if it's automotive quality that you're looking for, you have to have filtered doors on it to keep all the debris out of the shop, right? Yep. Okay. Now, the second part of that, we touched a little bit on filters. This happens to be a cartridge booth. So these are cartridge filters, all stacked too high, all the way across. In the cartridge filter, the vacuum's on, the cartridges basically pull the excess powder out of the air, collect it, they back holes, and drop the excess powder in the trays at the bottom. You can't see them real well right here, but the point is that it's collecting that powder that you can then trash. Or if this was one color you used all day long, you could reclaim it. If it was right. just one color all the time. Right. So this is just one option for filters or for filters. We have other options. We have things that we can do with polyester blankets, with paper and polyester combos, different types of filters that collect dust or powder. And uh, again, that's something that you're gonna have to consider. Not only when you go through depending, buy, depending on your budget. Yeah, depending on budget, what you're going to buy, how much waste you're generating. Right. Um, some people, that blow and go method, where they just have that gun cranked all the way up and they're just throwing powders out like a dragon breath. And then you got other people who you can barely see the powder coming out of the gun. Right. And you see very little powder on the floor. So there's all kinds. Just gonna do that. So filters are, are going to be a cost associated with. Right. So, moving past that, then when we're actually going to spray the part, we have to have the part grounded. It has to be a groundable part, right? You can utilize anything from a small alligator clip like this, but for a larger part, you may want something like this that's very hard to squeeze, right? That has very sharp points in here. The other end of the cable goes to a rod that's driven into the ground called an earth ground. We're putting a charge onto the part. We're not really meaning to, but it is accepting a charge. We want that charge to be bled immediately without resistance straight to ground so you get the maximum transfer efficiency of the powder onto the substrate for your part. He said earth ground. I'm going to say another thing. True earth ground. That's how a lot of people refer to it. Sure. And how do you achieve that? There are certain ways to not achieve it. Clamp it in your roof wall. And, and do not bring it back to the cabinet or the yeah. controller of your unit because you're just putting the charge back into all of your electrical controls. Don't do that. Yeah. This cable right here, you can see the same cable. I think you can see that right there. That white, or that not, not white, but yellow and green cable here. That's coming out of the back of the gun. Okay, the, the, the unit, the controller. That is used to ground the gun, not to go from here to the part. That's not, that's not grounding. That's really only there just because we don't, and VEMA does not trust your ground in your electrical circuitry. So in addition to where you plug it into the wall, 110 volts, if that's not really grounded, or electrician would call it bonded, then this additional alligator clip gives you added benefit and added security right. that it's going to be grounded. And how do you get true earth ground for your park? We need to talk about hooks and racks. Conveyors, typically a conveyor is fairly grounded. It's, it's substantial enough, it's connected to enough of things going on in the plant that they're usually grounded fairly well. But not the rack. No, but not a rolling rack. Uh, and the hooks. I can't. You, this is what you got to think about. When you hang that part, whatever it is, the part has to have a solid connection metal to metal. So that part has to go onto a clean hook. So if you've got this, this metal part here, got a hole cut in. 
This is a raw metal piece that you're going to powder. You would want a hook that is clean on the inside edge of the hook when you hook it. And you need it clean on the top of the hook so that when you hook it to the rack that also needs to be clean, it's got to be metal to metal, metal to metal, all the way back. When you do that, powder comes out of this gun. This is an amazing gun anyway. The powder comes out of this gun, and it's like you have to charge properly. It is going to love this piece. It's attracted. And I mean, you'll see it later in future videos. You're spraying your gun this way, and before you even turn the powder around, it's going to have brown because it's completely attracted to this piece. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the metal has nothing obstructing the ground. Ground is important. You're grounded, the operator's grounded through the back piece of the gun on the handle, right? I'll talk about that one too. A rubber glove insulates you so you are no longer grounded. We have grounding gloves that your operator can wear. They're very flexible, they're very light, and they don't sweat you to death. So it's a great compliment if you want to keep gloves on your operator. All right, Eddie, there's something behind you that we need to cover. What's that? What do you think? I don't know. Clean, dry air is critical, and I'm going to let Eddie tell you why. Inside this gaming unit are stepper motors, and they're very sensitive to moisture, oils, and contaminants. You have to go above and beyond to provide a piece of insurance in front of this and your compressed air stream to keep it running, basically. It won't run with dirty air. Uh, at a minimum, we use something like this that takes out particulate and moisture and oil, and oil vapors, a coalescer, it's called a coalescer. That's a minimum, okay? That works if that's all you can afford. This unit does the same thing. It takes out moisture, particulate, oils in the coalescer, and then this third stage is called a desiccant. And a desiccant drops the dew point, removes the moisture down to minus 40 degrees dew point, right? Minus 40 degrees F. So it is very, very dry air. This is operational room quality air. This is the best that you could achieve. It's plenty large enough to control this and your blow off air. If your blow off air is not connected through something like this, then I can take dirty shop air and contaminate my part and I'm going to ruin the pretreatment of it, right? So the powder's not going to stick. It's going to have fish eyes, things of that nature. So invest in good quality air treatment prior to the unit, and it will pay dividends always. How many times have you had the powder hose? You know, what about the powder hose? The air hose, like just an air bowl. Oh, boy. And put it into a white rag, dry white rag, and turn it on for 10 seconds to come out and there's warm water all over the end. With the, cu with the customer promising you, oh, I've got great air. It's not always the truth. If you have a dryer, if you have other protection systems upstream, if those fail, what's going to protect this? If these pieces at the drop where your equipment's going to be located. Right. Clean, dry air. Never forget that. It solves more problems than rejecting whatever. Not only that, it will shut the gun down. Your gun You're done. for repairs, and they're like, wait a minute, you have a warranty, but it's full of water and oil. Just like your car, if you put water in your gas tank, it's not going to run. This won't either. So, talking about clean, dry air, moving us into our next segment, we also have to have a clean shop environment. So, housekeeping is paramount. You want a good product, you want your customers to get a good product back, you got to keep a good shop. Sweep up every day. Clean things up. Organize. Organize your hooks. Have all your hooks organized so that you don't have to go reaching for them. Build a tree. Put your hooks on a tree. Have all of your cleanup equipment nearby. Your blow-off tools, OSHA-approved blow-off, all of that stuff has to be nearby at hand for you, for you or your operator to use, right? So it has to be easy for them, and it has to be something that is done on a routine. It's, it's part of your process. If you, if you do not do it, You'll get bad parts, and you get a bad reputation. That leads me to preventive maintenance. The whole PM sector of your business. Your hooks, your racks. Get them on a regular burn-off cycle, or 
Yeah. Average is about four four passes. After you sprayed apart with that hook about four times, take the hook offline, do some cleaning on it. Everlasting job stopper. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> you pull off that hook that's been used for the last two years and it's never been cleaned. Yep. The hook is that big, but now it's that big. Without and, it. And they think they're, they're getting great transfer efficiency on the line, but the powder's not going to get fairly dusty apart. Your powder supplier is going to love you because you're going to use more powder. Yep. And as you keep doing that, the bell curve of the issues that you'll have with rejects, oh. and complaints from customers, will dramatically keep your rise. So Way up. Spend that little bit of time, that little bit of money to routinely clean things that have been ready and already optimal. Buy four times the amount of hooks you need and cycle them. Rotate. Cycle, rotate them in and out. Rotation. Same with your racks. All right, let's move on. We're going to wrap up here soon, but I want, I want to ask you a question. I get asked this on a fairly regular basis when dealing with the shoppers. What for new, new shops, people that are interested in starting up powder coat? What kind of permits do I need? Some none. Some, quite a few permits, depending on your location. Your local authority always has precedent, period. One thing to be thinking about is, is that typically, for the powder itself, they don't make you permit for that. But you're going to have a waste stream, so you may have to be permitted for that. If it's a liquid, and I'm using a pre-treat, which could be an alkaline wash or an, a phosphate to increase the life out in the field if it gets scratched, uh, increase your salt spray, those chemicals, if you're not in a closed loop, are going to have to be treated before you can put them down your drain. One thing you have to think about there is, are you draining into a city sewer system or are you draining into septic? Things may be different there. Always check local guidelines. Your chemical supplier is your friend here. So you've seen your powder supplier be your friend and your partner. Now your chemical supplier is your friend and your partner. Obviously your equipment people are your partner. Air power you couldn't be a better partner for air power, right? But you have to look at these people as your inner circle, and these are your go-to people. They're going to keep you out of trouble and get you out of trouble when you get in trouble. And you think about OSHA and EPA and their impact, national fire marshal, everybody's impact on your business. You, you will hear from them, or you will deal with them. At some point. Their regulations. At some point, they're going to come. Uh, don't think that it's just to be blind. Uh, it will happen to you. They're all going to, they, they have regulations that affect you every day. So you might be wise to investigate that. Right. Speaking of regulations in OSHA, you have to have some PPE, right? Personal protective equipment. Absolutely. With that, all that's required with powder is a simple dust respirator. That's all that's required. However, other people want to investigate other means to keep more powder away from my operator or if I'm standing behind the part and powder's coming all over me, there are other devices. We can help you choose those correctly, right? Uh, so just think about PPE. If I'm washing that part and I get blowback on me, then I have to have eye protection, face protection. You may, if it's really bad and it blows back on you all the time, you may need to dress up like a New England fisherman in your yellow suit, right? That may not be your case. You may be blasting. If you blast the parts, protect yourself with blasting equipment. We have that as well for you to investigate for PPE. You may have your own supplier. We're happy to supply that for you if you need it. So, I'm going to wrap this up. Eddie, I appreciate your help with this. You're very welcome, sir. Air Power Live. Uh, what I do want to say is if you are interested in starting up a power coding operation, if you are running a power coding operation, at least you probably need a little bit of uh, a little bit of help taking it to the next level. You might need an upgrade on your gun. We want to talk to somebody about that. Please contact us at Air Power. Uh, we're going to put our 800 number down here for you. Contact us at uh, that number, and we would be glad to help you. You can also visit us online at airpower-usa.com. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Air Power Live. See you next time.